Today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and humor, two topics not often brought together. Um, but we could start with a famous witticism of Wittgenstein's. A philosophy book could be written consisting entirely of jokes. Uh, he didn't do that, of course, and this isn't a philosophy book, but you get the idea in the spirit of his quotation. Much more relevant is um, Alan Turing, who is, for many people, is thought of as starting artificial intelligence in this country. In a famous article of his in Mind, Philosophy Journal in 1950, we asked the question whether machines could think. And he started artificial intelligence, many think, by asking that question. And he considered in the course of the article the objection to the idea that, this idea, that machines wouldn't have a sense of humor. He'd rejected this objection. He thought they possibly could. And that's what, where we shall start today. You may have come here to find an answer to the question, can a computer create a joke? And the answer is, well, it's nearer than it was. Um, try this rather abstruse joke from GPT-3, which is a very large machine learning system, a currently fashionable AI engine that we shall return to later and say something about how it works. Um, it's a very abstruse joke and said to have been generated by GPT-3. George Cantor, the famous mathematician, was having dinner with some other famous mathematicians at a hotel. At the end of the meal, the waiter brought the bill, and Cantor discovered to his horror the bill was the sum of two inconsistent infinite series, the one a simple geometric series and the other a harmonic series. Cantor wrote to the manager of the hotel, protesting that this was impossible for the waiter to have computed the bill and requested that the waiter be sent to talk to him. The waiter came over and started to explain. Cantor said, excuse me, but I know the sum of the harmonic series is infinitely greater than the sum of the simple geometric series, so you've heard. And the waiter said, ah, but you see, sir, the geometric series was for the dinner, and the harmonic series was for the service. Now, this is extremely abstruse, and indeed rests on the hearer understanding what series can and cannot be computed. So if it is a joke, it's a joke for only very few people. Here's two other prompts from GPT-3 that may be slightly better. GPT-3 is a system where you give it a prompt and then it generates stuff automatically. Here's a definition of rigor. You give it the word rigor. It said, something for scientists to aspire to, a state of mind that would not be required if scientists could be trusted to do their job. Hmm, slightly a joke. I think this last one is rather better. You, you prompt it with the literature. A name given to other people's published papers referred to by scientists without actually reading them. Now, this is now much closer to a joke. Um, you'll make up your own minds on this. You're certainly closer to jokes than anything a computer has come up with before, I suggest. Um, well, I may have cause to correct that later when we look at some work of other people, but I think that remains true. What's this talk about? Well, what is humor anyway? How have the great and the good defined it? And is it universal across time and geography? Is it dependent on language? Uh, Benny Hill's humor, for those of you who remember it, was almost entirely visual. And cartoons, of course, require the picture as well as the writing. Secondly, what has artificial intelligence to offer? There are two kinds of artificial intelligence going at the moment. One is about rules and about structures and systems and representations. And we shall ask in connection with that, can there be rules for humor? And we look at Raskin's theory of humor as mismatched scripts versus the more currently fashionable theory of AI at the moment, which is it's a machine learning system of very, very large networks of nodes, which statistically put things together in ways that their um, creators don't always totally understand. And that'll be the GPT-3 machine that we saw the output from a moment ago. If we ask what the great and the good of thought, thinkers of thought, humor consists in, there are three basic categories under which they categorized humor. The first is ridicule. Hobbes, the British philosopher, said it was sudden glory, superiority by laughter. Descartes, the French philosopher, said humor was scorn and ridicule. Scruton, a more recent conservative philosopher, said humor was the attentive demolition of a person. Bergson, the French philosopher, said that he was always seeing humans fall under laws of nature, of which, of course, slipping on the banana skin is the best known. The other way of categorizing humor has been incongruity, which I think has been a more productive view. 
uh, Herbert Spencer thought it was the diversion of one's attention from something significant to insignificant. Hegel, the great German philosopher, thought it was an incongruent treatment of things away from the customary norm. Schopenhauer, another great German philosopher, thought it was the incongruity of our knowledge of things and our perceptions. The third idea is that it's a relief. It's a relief from tension. Kant, the great German philosopher, thought it was a metamorphosis of tense expectation into nothing. Dewey, the American philosopher of education, thought it was the sudden relaxation of strain. And Freud, of course, the founder of psychoanalysis, thought it was the emergence and relief of deeply repressed experience. Now, Freud's view has, in fact, connections directly to artificial intelligence because of the influence his work had on Marvin Minsky at MIT, who is for many people the greatest figure that artificial intelligence has ever produced. And Minsky acknowledged several debts to Freud. Firstly, Freud's view that the mind consisted of independent modules, not all consciously accessible. For Freud, if you remember, they were the, the, um, the ego, the id, and the conscious. And they were not all accessible. You couldn't accept, access the id, for example. But for Freud, the, these were very separate things. And Fominsky took this over and created a theory of mind which essentially consisted of independent modules operating independently and communicating with each other. And they both got the idea, and I think Minsky got it from Freud, that humor was the control of our inner logic and repression. He, Minsky got something else as well, not from Freud in this case, but he created something called frame theory, that the mind was based on fixed sequential structures which we operate. And we'll see later in the talk that this was the basis of Raskin's theory of humor as clashing scripts. We're now going to ask the question, how universal is humor? Is it universal over time, over space? Over time, we still have access to Roman joke books, amazingly, and they don't seem all that funny. And as many of you will know, Shakespeare is only 400 years away from us, but much of his humor is almost impossible for actors to put on the stage. Um, if it's verbal humor we're talking about, we know that the US and the UK differ considerably in what they think is funny in the same language and the very close cultures. On the other hand, if you take language out of the equation, you think of the humor of Benny Hill, Charlie Chaplin, or Mr. Bean, these, of course, can be transferred to almost any television system in the world, and people do think they're funny because they don't involve any language. Um, old jokes do survive in literature. Um, are they funny? Here's Macrobius, an aristocrat in a Roman joke book, having met his exact double and asks, was your mother a housemaid in our palace? No, my father was a gardener there. Well, there's modern versions of that joke. Some people still find that quite funny. Um, Shakespearean wit, I think, comes off almost worse than it's only 400 years ago. Look at this snippet from Romeo and Juliet. Gregory, oh my word, will not carry coals. No, but then we should be colliers. I mean, and we should be in collar. We'll draw. It, it, it's very hard for actors to make that work, isn't it? It doesn't seem to have survived across time terribly well. Um, another interesting question is whether humor is a state with no real content at all. If you've been to a comedy show or watched one on television, you know that people get to a state where they're simply laughing no matter at what. Terrible jokes. They laugh because others are laughing. Um, William James, the famous American psychologist <clears throat> and what's normally called a behaviorist, had the view that many people didn't like, which was that um, we don't cry because we're sad. We're sad because we find ourselves crying. And you could apply that to humor and say, we're amused because we're laughing. We're laughing in the comedy show, and therefore we're amused. Um, I think there's something in that. Um, and of course, laughing automata are very old and rested on something of the same principle for making people laugh. Um, here's the kind of thing you used to see in amusement arcades when I was young. And if you are too young to ever see one of these things, they're not terribly funny, but they did make people laugh, it seems. Here's Jolly Jack, the laughing sailor. There used to be things like this on every pier in England. <laughs> and there's Jack laughing. He's not terribly funny, is he? Um, and yet, 
Some people clearly thought he was. I, I, I throw him in because it's an interesting example of automated humour of an unusual kind. Let's now ask the question whether humour is an identifiable human trait. There's no point in thinking of it in connection with artificial intelligence if it isn't. And it, it seems certainly it is. It seems heritable. There's good evidence for that. And there's very good evidence it conveys evolutionary advantage since funny people are thought to be more attractive. There's plenty of evidence for that. In common sense, I mean, we know that dating sites like Tinder rate GSOH, great sense of humor, as very high up the list of desirables. Some Austrian research recently suggests that funny people are actually more intelligent. If so, and if AI should aim to replicate any form of distinctive human behavior, then of course it should aim to replicate humor, which almost certainly means understanding and telling jokes. In addition, and we'll come to this at conclusion, there's very good reason to think that appropriate humor eases the human interface. We get on better with each other when things are, can be funny or made funny. Um, therefore, since making the human computer interface accessible and easy to use and um, in every way better um, is a desirable technological aim at the moment, you might well think, therefore, that introducing humor into it will be a very worthwhile thing to do and of great commercial power. I think this is indeed the case. Let's ask the question what humor has to do with language. We just mentioned that there's a wordless international humor started by Charlie Chaplin in film, which of course suggested that humor doesn't actually need language. But are, are things falling over funny? That's wordless. I mean, uh, much of Chaplin's humor does consist in people falling over. How about robots falling over? How about this? Here, yeah, here's a, here's robots falling over. Is it funny? Those are actually robots in the place where I used to work in Florida. And, uh, but they're not funny, are they? I mean, I suppose they're put into a movie because somebody does think they're funny, but I don't think they're funny in the way that humans falling about are funny. Um, cartoons suggest that humor has a language and a non-language aspect. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Because you can't usually tell a good cartoon as a joke. Take a good cartoon, you can't repeat it as a joke for blind people very easily. Um, here's one of my all-time favorite cartoons from The New Yorker. Um, I won't try to tell it, you can see it. Man, man behind the desk, woman in front. And he is saying, I see by your resume that you're a woman. This is a classic New Yorker cartoon. And of course, it's quite interesting because, of course, modern, it's quite an old cartoon. I think it goes back to the 60s. Um, modern thought has changed the meaning of this entirely because of course with gender and sex changes now everywhere you might think that you would have to read somebody's cv to see if they were a woman but let's not go there for this for the moment let's just take the cartoon at face value why is that cartoon funny um the language and the visuals are both essential here you can't give up either you can't tell it as a joke even though it's changed utterly we'll come back to that in a moment as to why that is um I, it will have to do with the clashing of scripts, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, are funny things a category? Let's pursue the, the generalities again for a moment. Minsky, who we've already referred to, had what he called suitcase concepts. Um, a suitcase concept was a concept that didn't really have anything that linked the things that came under it. Um, cancer has turned out to be a suitcase concept, hasn't it? We used to think cancer was one thing, possibly with one cause. Now, medicine's told us very clearly, cancer is just a mixed bag under a name. Cancer is a mixed bag for a huge number of different diseases. Um, so maybe humor's like that. Maybe humor is a whole set of different things which don't have a great deal in common. And they may be in a hierarchy. I mean, look at this list I've put down there um, casually, not with any great meaning, but puns are always at the bottom, the worst form of humor, witticisms, going upwards, visual jokes and pratfalls, shaggy dog stories are usually thought funny. The best jokes come at the top. I'm sure there'd be many, should be many more things in that list. I'm just saying that if humor turns out to be a range of different things, 
from the fallings over and the cartoons to the clever jokes and the shaggy dog stories, will it be possible to arrange them in order of humor, of humanness, funniness, value, um, scores? I don't know. Many people have tried to do this. Um, another, before we get down to our AI details, just one last thought is science fiction. Science fiction has often shown the way ahead in human thinking. Does it show the way ahead in humor? Just let me remind you of some of the places where classic humor has poked its way into science fiction. In Star Trek, Star Trek Commander Data had a humor chip, and this was thought to be a, a comic notion in Star Trek, where he had a humor chip that could be turned on and off. In Heinlein's famous story, The Moon, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, the supercomputer Mike develops humor on its own. It develops it all by itself. It discovers it. Um, there's a, a sarcastic robot in, in Rogue One. Um, and we know that in Adam's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Marvin is a sad robot who's usually thought very funny indeed. Um, so there's no doubt that science fiction has tried to portray several of the things I've already talked about, the wordlessness, the developing humor, possibly sarcasm, uh, possibly sadness, possibly humor as something that can be simply embedded um, into something. You could, as it were, give a, a person without a sense of humor a sense of humor by some kind of brain operation. I'm sure science fiction has tackled that question in the past. Um, this is one of my all-time favorites from science fiction. Um, Alpha Veal is one of the great French sci-fi movies. And in it, if you remember, there is a sign on a machine that says, insert one franc, our sorry enfant. And the hero puts a franc into the machine and out comes a little ticket with merci written on it. I still find this wonderful because it's, of course, why is it comic? I don't know. It is. There's no reward. You just get thank you from the machine for giving it a franc. Let's now get closer to our goal of talking about artificial intelligence and bringing it into our discussion. Let's ask, on the basis of what we've seen so far, are there rules for humour? Now, much of artificial intelligence used to be about rules. Rules that a computer could operate. I mean, everybody associates computers with the operation of rules. As we'll see, that's all changed in recent years. But that is the classic view of computer operation and artificial intelligence. So if we ask that, we could ask, could there then be rules that a computer might operate for humor? Could there be, let's say, an Oscar machine? Are Oscar Wilde's witticisms of the kind that you could turn into rules so you could have an Oscar machine? Um, I wondered this years ago when I heard his famous witticism, I can resist anything but temptation. It's funny when you hear it, but then you think, well, maybe a machine could operate something like that. So let's ask about the rules for Oscar witticisms. What they, would they be like? I'm inventing all this, but you'll get the general idea. Suppose we take two tightly bound words like X and Y, so that each predicts the other, like resist temptation. If you see resist, you could think temptation. If you see temptation, you might think give way to or resist. So take two words like that, and then make a rule that says, um, I can X anything but Y. And that will be funny if you X and Y are the right kind of tightly bound concepts. So loving my wife is a tightly bound concept for many people. So if you put those in place for X and Y, you get, I can love anything but my wife. Well, I suppose in the world of jokes, some people might think that was funny. Um, so it makes you wonder if there could be an Oscar machine, doesn't it? Um, wouldn't be terribly funny, but maybe better than absolutely nothing. You can't help thinking that he operated something like that in his head. Um, some AI theorists have sort of thought along these lines. Um, at Edinburgh, Ritchie and Binstead um, tried out simple rules for AI humor. Um, a system they constructed called JAPE, which had access to a very large vocabulary and could search for concepts connected in certain ways. Rather like I was just describing with the Oscar machine, concepts tied together in certain ways in a dictionary. So they asked their system, this is supposed to be a genuine output from JAPE, they asked their system, what kind of tree is nauseated? And it said, a sycamore which again is weak, but just about crawling over the edge into being a joke. Um, the most complicated and serious 
piece of AI research using rules for humor is Victor Raskin's work. Victor Raskin is at Indiana, and he has a theory of humor which owes a lot to Minsky, who we talked about earlier. Minsky's view that much mental activity consisted in preformed scripts that we operated and that we understood other people because they also were operating scripts so that when you go into a restaurant, you know what the script is, you generally eat before you pay, before you leave and so on. Um, so in the New Yorker, if we take Raskin's theory and apply it to the New Yorker cartoon, remember the New Yorker cartoon, I see by your resume that you're a woman, you could interpret that in Raskin's terms as the clashing of two interpretive scripts. Um, the first script would be, I interpret a person's sex by looking at them across the desk. And the second would be, I interpret a person's sex or gender, if you prefer, from the CV if you can, can't see them. Okay, but the joke here, of course, is that you can see them. So the man in the cartoon clearly can see the woman. So if there is a joke there, Raskin would explain it as saying, it's the clashing of two scripts, telling gender and sex by looking, telling gender and sex by reading. And if you get these mixed up, it's funny. And I think in some way, if you like that kind of explanation, that does go some way to explain what's going on. Um, there's a, a famous, uh, slightly risque example of this in 19th century Oxford. The warden of Wadham College, Oxford, was responsible for the following quip. X was invented to fill the gap between even the song and dinner in hall. And what he put in the place of X was the then illegal sexual practice. And this was thought to be a huge witticism at the time and is often quoted in books of Oxford witticisms. Now, you could say that's funny. Whatever sexual practice you put for X, um, there's a clash of scripts for a clash of scripts. You could say there for for sex and for formal social and religious practice, like even song and dinner. Uh, that seems to me a joke that lends itself quite clearly to Raskin's clashing of scripts explanation. Here's another one that many people have found funny. There's a famous advert on television for Haribo sweets. Um, I, I'll tell you what it is before you, I play it for you. It's, it's policemen on duty in a car and they're discussing with childlike voices um, the Haribo candy. And of course, it lends itself exactly to Raskin's explanation because you could say there's a script for sweets for children talked about by children, and another script for formal police on duty. And if you mix these two up, you get something which I think is pretty comic. Here it is, if you've never seen it. Harry Bustar mix. Yes. Maybe the bear could steal the ring, which is the crown jewel, hmm. could run away with it, maybe the police could find him. Yeah. We are the police. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there it is. So <clears throat> the question I can now ask is, does humor on Raskin's view of clashing scripts function like other mental and artificial intelligent functions? For example, metaphor. Think of metaphor. The bowl of night is a classic metaphor. The night sky is a flat thing. The bowl is a curved receding surface. And the metaphor comes from, as it were, putting these two clashing concepts together. Um, it's been a common observation that much of science rests on metaphors and clashing scripts. Think back to the famous old, um, I think, 17th century, well, of course, it's a Greek view 2,000 years ago um, that atoms were small, separate objects. But in the 18th century, there was definitely the view that atoms were like billiard balls bouncing off each other. Um, people in the 18th century understood the mechanics of billiards very well and the atoms were invisible but not understood. So they tried to understand atoms by thinking about billiard balls. This, of course, was hugely successful. So in a way, science was also, has also advanced systematically by what you might call clashing scripts. Um, uh, thirdly and lastly, perhaps a little more recondite, um, there's a famous situation in philosophy called uh, ambiguity of reference. Of philosophers like to talk about two ways of picking out a person. Suppose the same person is picked out by Joe's uncle and Fred's son. Um, all kinds of philosophical problems arise if you don't realize that Joe's uncle and Fred's son are the same person and you can't substitute one for the other. 
and keep certain sentences as being true. This is the kind of thing that has amused philosophers for a considerable time. But then um, if you want to get across the idea they are the same person, in fact, what you're doing in the terms we've been talking about with Raskin's theory is you're amalgamating different scripts. You may have one whole script for Joe's uncle. He's a nice, generous person who brings presents around at Christmas. You might have a quite different script for Fred's son, who you know differently, that he's a, a mean and unpleasant person. And you've never brought these scripts together because you didn't know they were the same person. If you find out they are the same person and real things like this happen, then you have to amalgamate these scripts in some way so they clash. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's funny or that it's doing science or doing metaphor. I'm just trying to point out that this notion Raskin used to explain the basis of humor, of clashing scripts, is in fact a very fundamental mental operation, one might say, that can be applied and reapplied in all kinds of areas of mental activity, metaphor, science, and reference. Um, let's now get nearer to the heart of things and to the heart of what's going on in modern artificial intelligence. Um, for its first 40 or 50 years, artificial intelligence was under the paradigm called symbolic AI. Some people call this good old fashioned AI. It was driven by logic and reasoning, uh, building up in the computer representations of the world, which the computer then manipulated, made deductions, made inferences. Sometimes this work was called expert systems. It had certain great successes. Um, I was brought up in this paradigm, um, but around the 1990s, things began to change. Um, there had always been a subject in artificial intelligence called machine learning, and it was usually done by rules, just like everything else. But suddenly, a school of thought arose. It had been there from the very beginning. It had been called cybernetics once upon a time, but let's not go there. Uh, cybernetics died out. But then suddenly, in the 1990s, a version of cybernetics came back which said that, no, let's not think about AI as rules and logic and reasoning. Let's think about AI as learning and learning by statistical methods that we can do with statistical mathematics. And we can recognize patterns based on statistical methods. And we can design computer networks that will operate these statistical methods. And these networks will actually function in such a way as to represent things. So a network could be set up that represented faces. And actually, the truth is, these, these networks have turned out to be far better for things like representing and recognizing faces from cameras than anything to do with rules. Um, must be careful there. There are rules for representing faces and based on measurements between the nose and the eyes. But basically, the successful methods have all been statistical. And in recent years, uh, since the turn of the century, a great deal of advance has been made in machine learning, what's often now called deep learning. And it's won things like the chess championship of the world at intervals. Um, it's won the Go championship. The Go is more striking than the chess. The chess also has elements of rules about it. But the, the work done to make the best Go player in the world was definitely done by statistical machine learning. Um, this computer simply taught itself to play Go by playing it against itself for millions and millions of games and learning from its behavior. And then it took on the world Go champion and won. And this new, a new approach to artificial intelligence has been much disputed. Uh, a lot of people don't like it. Why don't they like it? except apart from the fact that they feel affectionate about the way they always used to do things and don't want to think about them in a different way and don't want to do the statistical mathematics. No, it's more than that. It's that the chief worry about machine learning methods, which are the ones you see in newspapers all the time now, been hugely successful in detecting diseases, um, detecting cancers, detecting breast tumors, and so on. The worry about these is they can be easily fooled in the way that humans can't. Um, both of the systems, I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment about fooling them, but both systems you have to understand have intractable problems. 
but that the statistical method is now very much, much in the lead with systems like the huge network called GPT-3 that produced that rather abstruse joke I showed you at the very beginning. Um, here's the problem about machine learning. It can easily learn from the wrong features and get things wrong. And the other main problem is that the researchers themselves can't really explain why a successful network achieves the results it does. And people feel uneasy about that. In fact, there's a whole new area of artificial intelligence now um, called explainable AI, which has been hugely funded by the American government, which is devoted to trying to get these large machine networks, these learning networks, to explain why they come to the results they do when they make a medical diagnosis, to try and get them to explain why they make that diagnosis. Because even if they're largely correct, people feel very uneasy following them when they don't know why they got the results they did. Look at this example on dogs and wolves. Um, this is quite interesting. Um, somebody built a very successful dog versus wolf discriminator based on photographs. And this is quite difficult to do because dogs and wolves are very similar, as you know. Um, but this was very successful. How did it do it? Um, then suddenly somebody noticed something very strange. All the photographs of wolves it had used were all in snow. And there was very good reason to think, and they showed this by simply giving some pictures of wolves that weren't in snow, and then it failed to recognize them. All the machine learning system had done was to work out for itself that the pictures that were called wolf had snow in. So all it had to do was recognize snow, big white patches, which is much easier to do than recognizing the complicated features of a wolf. Um, here's another example of why it's thought to be quite easy to fool machine learning systems. This may be a little difficult to see, I don't know if you can see it, but here is an example on recognizing a, um, a Granny Smith apple. And on the first side, uh, there's a recognition system for apples, and it decides it's 85, the machine learning system decides on the basis of that apple that it can see that it's 85% likely to be a Granny Smith apple, and only half a percent likely to be an iPod, um, which is correct. It obviously is a Granny Smith apple. But then somebody thought how to fool it. They simply put a label on the Granny Smith called iPod. There it is on the right, you can see. They've just stuck a label on it with the word iPod on. And now, look what's happened. It now thinks, the machine, same machine learning system, now thinks it's 99% likely it's an iPod because it's labeled iPod. And only 0.1% likely it's a Granny Smith apple. Even though any human being can see, it obviously is a Granny Smith apple. Um, the future of AI is very uncertain at the moment. We simply don't know which of these artificial intelligence approaches will win? Um, the statistical approach with networks, simply people say, well, all it requires is more data, give us more data, make GPT-3 even larger. It's already got millions of nodes, give it more nodes and more data, and it will get better and better. Um, but it's not clear that that actually will work. Nobody knows, we shall find out. Um, if you still cling, as some people do, to the coded knowledge approach to artificial intelligence, the, the former one, the older, good old-fashioned AI approach of coded knowledge, people say, well, all we need is more coded knowledge, and we shall be able to make do better reasoning, and we'll in the end do better than the statistical methods. Um, the kind of evidence you produce for that these days is the fact that virtually all medical knowledge has been coded into one of two very large structured coded databases, which are essentially just coded symbolic knowledge, which represent virtually all human knowledge of medicine. And these are very widely used in medicine to make deductions, to make inferences, and to find courses of treatment from given symptoms. And they also are very successful. In fact, a lot of medical researchers can't now imagine working in medicine without access to these coded databases of medicine. Um, the genetic databases of humans and animals are coded into coded databases, not into statistical semantic networks. So 
both of these approaches to AI already have gigantic resources behind them, gigantic investment. And I have to say, the statistical approach is in the lead, but we don't yet know which one will win. And to come back to our topic, we don't know yet which one will win out for AI humor. You saw some results of um, uh, rules for humor based on what you might call the coded knowledge approach. You also saw some very abstruse jokes from statistical learning networks. And you'll judge for yourself, if you remember, which of those are funnier. They're both pretty weak is the truth and both have something to be said for them. Um, why, why are we doing all this? Why is there in this investment in AI and humor in research? And indeed, there are grants out there now, even the European Commission sponsors grants in this subject. Well, I think I hinted at the beginning why this is so. Um, everybody recognizes the value of humor interaction between people. Uh, big corporations like Apple certainly recognize it. Um, uh, Microsoft and Amazon have invested in creating agents with gender, education, personality, political opinions, agents to deal with customers, and they notice that if these agents have some form of sense of humor, often these days I have to say scripted in by people, but may in the end be learned, we don't know. And of course, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, all these famous household companions that are already out there in their millions, they also have a lot of funny responses built in. If you want to test that, you say to any of them, how do I bury a body and see the response you get back? I mean, it's obviously been coded in by a humorous researcher somewhere, but these are meant to make these machine companions, these machine conversationalists more acceptable and more commercially advantageous. Um, here's the last word. This paragraph in front of you was generated, I believe, by GPT-3 himself or herself. Um, it is actually a product of that very large semantic statistical network that I told you about. So let me read it to you. It's, very, it's quite extraordinary as a piece of prose coming from a machine. Artificial intelligence programs lack consciousness and self-awareness. They will never be able to have a sense of humor. They will never be able to appreciate art or beauty or love. They will never feel lonely. They will never have sympathy for other people or animals, for the environment. They will never enjoy music or fall in love or cry at the drop of a hat. Well, there is the system talking to you about itself. It doesn't mean it's right, but it is interesting that it said that when asked, isn't it? Thank you.